want to pay tribute to Bev Harden's leadership for the work um, that HE has done over a number of years now. I think some of you are back for the third year for this annual event around uh, a, um, advanced clinical practice. And I, um, in the next few minutes, I want to say why I think this agenda is hugely important and, um, and hopefully that one of the things you'll help us with today uh, is actually thinking through what some of the uh, challenges are over this next period of time, but also how we can reach for some of the answers. And then in the spirit of co-production, co-creation, we can begin to advance this agenda, but do it together uh, by working together. Um, a, a conference for me, if you go back to uh, the word itself, is where people come together both to talk to each other and critically listen to each other about the future. So, why do I think this is important? I think it's important because the delight I got by being appointed to the job in HEE is that um, somebody has given me the opportunity to think through uh, the challenge of what the future workforce will look like. All those young people that started university in the autumn of this year will still be working in 2060. And one of the questions I've been asking myself is, what will they be doing in 2060? What will the job be in 26? I won't be around to see this. I'll be 105. <laughs> but the, the challenge of uh, what will the job be and how are we currently uh, organising and arranging uh, higher education, further education, the way that you operate to begin to prepare people for the jobs that they'll be doing over this next period of time. Um, and I think that is a brilliant, brilliant question to begin to reflect on and answer. And like a lot of these questions, uh, we begin to answer that now. Uh, we can't keep putting that off uh, for a number of years. So we've got to think through uh, what, um, what the answer to that question is. And I'd like to place uh, the work that you've been doing and the work that you're going to think about today in that broader context. I believe that... Um, advanced clinical practice agenda allows clinicians in the NHS and beyond to play as broad a role as possible in caring for the population that I believe we serve. And your participation today, as I've said, will help us think through some of those issues and you will bring ideas and suggestions and challenges and solutions to that debate and that's what we want to get out of uh, today and that's the spirit of the workshops. Um, I think the interim people plan set out a number of ambitions of which uh, advanced clinical practice was uh, at the heart, at the centre and uh, we will continue uh, through PERDA to work on the full people plan. We won't be able to publish it as we anticipated uh, towards the end of November. Uh, we'll have to wait for a new government to come in uh, to office uh, and then um, we can begin to have the conversation with them. But I do anticipate um, ACPs being a part of um, that full people plan, uh, which is a desire to see uh, a workforce operating at the top of, the, of your game, of, of your colleagues' games, in multi-professional teams with flexible training and a population-based approach to service provision and workforce planning. I think that's the prize that we're playing for in these conversations, and I hope we can explore that today. I just want to put <clears throat> part of me, the conversations we're going to have today in a broader Context: The World Health Organization uh, projected that by uh, 2030 uh, there will be a shortage of healthcare professionals of 18 million uh, worldwide. So I think what that uh, stat does to me is it makes me think about, so what do we need to do where there's a global workforce challenge in this country to begin to address that? And that also leads me to uh, what we've done in the past is not necessarily going to be good for what we need to do in the future. We do need uh, more, but we also need different. And I think the conference today should be about thinking out how in that global context we can think about more and different. I think that's what some of you have been doing in all your workplaces as you've taken forward these roles. And those of you that are practising are probably doing that on a daily basis as you practise. So to some extent, the future is with us now uh, and you're busy delivering that. And um, as I say, the opportunity today is to begin to take that agenda much further forward.
So I think uh, advanced practice pl uh, workforce plays a vital role in building a more adaptable workforce across an agenda which I believe has got to be multi-professional, uh, an agenda which includes, uh, I apologise if I list, miss anybody out, you shouldn't do a list unless you know you're going to get everybody, uh, and I know each time I do this I'll miss somebody out. So if I get my apologies in up front, but it's an agenda that includes pharmacy, nursing, healthcare science, uh, physiotherapy, to name just a few. That's my get-out-of-jail card. Um, and uh, I believe, and I've witnessed and seen, you enhancing capacity and capability within teams by supporting existing and more established roles, which I believe will continue to be needed into the future as well. Uh, you help to improve clinical continuity, provide more patient-focused care, enhance multi-professional teams and help to make, uh, to provide safe, accessible, high-quality care for the people that you serve. And I believe uh, passionately that healthcare is a team sport and that everyone has a role to play in making those teams as effective and as safe as possible. And uh, I also believe that you and your colleagues are the glue that holds that team together. So the metaphor I've been using, and I've used this for a long time, uh, if Bevan had taken you through my CV, I began my career as a social worker in 1978, uh, often doing child protection work, and the heart of child protection work is multi-professional practice. Um, so I go back a long way on multi-professional practice and its importance. And when you see it getting it right, there's no news whatsoever. You see it getting it wrong, and it's all over the front pages and on the top line on the newspapers uh, uh, and our news programmes each and every time. And at its heart, I think multi-professional practice is about the different professional groups coming together and actually playing their role. I don't want to see all the different constituencies in multi-professional practice, all the different professions, put in a blender and the blender switched on so you get a smoothie where you can't see the distinct and discrete roles that each individual profession is going to play. If I can just keep with the um, uh, food metaphor, uh, and I hope this doesn't upset anybody, but if I keep with a food metaphor, what I want to see is a good old Irish stew where you can actually see the different components uh, that are going into the stew that make uh, what is effectively the meal that comes out of it. So it's not, uh, I do want to see a blend, but I don't want to see a reduction of the professions that are making a contribution. And I think what you're doing in SEPs is beginning to think that through. Um, and that's what um, you can offer uh, to the people that we serve, uh, both now and in the future. The other context I want to set out, which um, is important, is the changes which are taking place demographically in our society. I'm a baby boomer, and you all know the figures that are coming through as that uh, generation, my generation, worked their way through over the next 30 or so years. Uh, as we're, uh, it's that generation that's going to drive the demand over the next 30-year period. And you've got, you know, the, uh, those of us over 85 is going to double, etc. All those uh, figures that come through that you, I think you'll know very well. And the thing that strikes me about the baby boomer generation is the good news we are living longer. The not so good news is we're not living healthier, longer lives. We're taking into our old age complex comorbid conditions. And a key challenge on complex comorbid conditions is you need more than one profession to provide a solution to how people are best cared. And that, for me, is the driver of multi-professional working. That's why we absolutely need to get it right uh, in terms of the different contribution professions uh, are going to make to that agenda. But I want to um, just deal with one of the um, uh, elephants in the room uh, in relation to this agenda. Uh, there is a narrative which says that increasing the numbers of ACPs is about healthcare on the cheap, about reducing quality by substituting uh, one role for another role. Critically, it's often levelled at substituting uh, doctors for other professions. And yes, I think the boundary between the professions is becoming blurred. And I think the reason for that is this changed balance of knowledge and influence amongst nurses, doctors and other professions resulting in more nurses able to lead uh, clinical practice alongside doctors, but not just nurses, other professions beginning to do that. If I think what I did in 1978 in my first day as a social worker 
were the nurses I was working with in those times who were doing children's safeguarding work, child protection work at that time. And I think about the conversations I had with them about the job that they did. Um, and I now compare that to the job that is taking place now. That's a 42-year difference. I can't find the words to describe what that difference is. Science and technology has moved on. Our understanding, our skill base, our education, our research knowledge has moved on. And that has shifted the jobs that people are doing. Uh, for those of you that are physios, um, I didn't train with physiotherapists in uh, the university that I went to. But I had a very poor sporting career through my young adulthood uh, and I was constantly on a treatment table with uh, busted legs, uh, damaged ankles, etc, etc. But I now, uh, if I um, still uh, fool myself that I've got some health around, uh, physical health, and I still find myself using uh, physios, and um, the technology that is now available, um, the way that you conceive of your job about whether it's hands-on, hands-off, whether it's about using exercise regime, etc., etc., has changed dramatically during that period of time. The point that I want to make, as science and technology moves, as our understanding of science and technology moves, it changes the knowledge base that we're using, as the knowledge base changes, the skill base changes, the roles that you carry on change, etc., etc. It's an advancement conversation. It's a great conversation to have. And my professional life has been enriched by working in that kind of environment about where people uh, move on. So I think the issue is uh, around how can we begin to work in that uh, environment where uh, knowledge uh, and uh, practice is changing. And that's something that we should embrace. It's not something we should be afraid of. Um, operating at the peak of skills and knowledge, blending the roles that we've got to play as professionals and making our contribution uh, provides a fantastic opportunity to ensure that we can provide the very best care for the people that we serve, the patients that we work with. But also, I think, create a, a fantastic environment for us as professionals, for us to work in, um, uh, to excite us, to interest us, uh, and to enable us to develop. Um, so I want to deploy an argument today, and every day I stand in front of an audience like this, which is if we're going to seize the future and invent the profession uh, for the future and meet the needs that we know we are going to have to meet as we move forward, um, let's have a, an open uh, and um, uh, transparent debate about how uh, we can seize the opportunity that's presented to us by multiprofessional practice and not see this as something which is about taking over other people's roles and uh, the debate about substitution. I want to be respectful of that debate and my point about a conference is about listening and learning and we need to actually settle that debate but I really do want to invite us into a space uh, to have that conversation. HEE invested something like 36 million in uh, this current financial year in advanced practice training and will continue to invest uh, in this direction of travel to support uh, the work that you uh, undertake and that we support. The fact there is, for the first time, a definition of what an ACP is, there's agreed requirements for entry, I think represents a fantastic uh, progress um, um, in the work uh, that is being taken forward and I'm proud of the work that HEE has developed. I can take no credit for this. Uh, as Bev says, I'm uh, just about coming up to my first year in the role. Um, but I think what I've witnessed is uh, some outstanding work um, where we're beginning to establish that consistent national guidance and principles that follow, um, that allow you to follow throughout your professional lives and beginning to map out a career pathway, which I think is so important. Um, I've got somebody in the front and she said, I'm going to give you a sign when it's five minutes. And I said, I'll probably ignore you. So um, uh, just to, uh, uh, there's a few more things I want to uh, just share with you. Um, so um, uh, I'm going to carry on if uh, that's OK. Um, there's no point in being a chair if you can't take some liberties. So um, it's when you start booing from the back row that I know I've overstayed my welcome. So um, uh, that's not an invitation, by the way. Um, uh, I know Mark is going to pick up on some of these things uh, later, so the reality is I'm probably stealing a bit of Mark's time here as well. But um, 
I also want to uh, just have a call out for the Academy in Adv uh, for Advancing Practice uh, and uh, making that a reality. It seems to me to be pr uh, about providing some of the infrastructure that's so necessary uh, for getting this um, uh, work embedded because I think it will recognise uh, programmes of education and training, uh, it will recognise the skills that individuals are beginning to develop and are necessary if you're working at an advanced practice level and awarding a certificate of equivalence and enable people to join a, a directory of those who have completed HE accredited ACP education uh, programmes. It's all part and parcel of establishing the infrastructure and the framework for the advancement of uh, the work that you're going to be talking about. One of my pitches for the chair's role in HEE is that we need to, to do two things in HEE. Firstly, we needed to concentrate on what our core purpose is, that's the education and training of the future workforce. Uh, but secondly, uh, we also need to uh, collaborate with others. Uh, one of the things that has surprised me coming into the education and training world is just how fragmented it is uh, and just how much alignment is required between those of you that work in HEIs, those of you that are employers, those of you that work in the professional bodies to get that uh, alignment. And I think a day like today is a fantastic opportunity to get the key partners, uh, key individuals into a room and begin to have the necessary uh, conversations. But collaboration for me is absolutely key uh, to success. It's not just teamwork at a clinical level with individual patients and their families, but it also operates at a, a national uh, level as well. Um, and I want to emphasise that partly the conversation today needs to be about what more but also what difference uh, we need as we go forward uh, over this next period of time. And I don't know about you, um, uh, I compare um, technology in my personal life and then technology in my professional life. So if we just make two comparisons, my holiday this year was in Mallorca. I booked all the travel through the app on EasyJet. It was dead easy. And it gave me real-time information about whether the plane was running to time, etc., 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 for those of you that have used it. It felt really easy. I do a lot of travel in this job, and I often use the apps to book my train tickets and actually just find out whether the trains are going to be on time, etc., etc. It feels very easy. Um, I've got a shocking bike and I was trying to renegotiate my physiotherapy uh, um, uh, appointment. Brilliant physiotherapist that I see uh, in where I live in Kent as part of the Kent Community Trust. Gosh, three telephone calls, two left messages, two weeks. Uh, when I got there, the guy was brilliant, but what a palaver of getting access and it's just that contrast between the ease in some of our personal lives on navigating services and in our professional lives and the difference between the two. So the digital revolution is here, it's with us and it is going to change and the work that Eric Topple did uh, in January this year where he looked at what the implications of technology are for clinical, he was looking at doctors to be truthful but I think the messages that he came up with apply to all healthcare staff, not just healthcare professionals, uh, will begin to transform uh, the way uh, that um, services are both conceived of, but then uh, developed and then delivered. Um, and I think in an environment where more people will have their genome sequenced, health data will become a fundamental part of care, artificial intelligence will grow, uh, uh, we'll have an NHS where low-cost sequencing technology telemedicine, smartphone apps, biosensors for mobile diagnostics and monitoring, speech recognition and automated image interpretation will become increasingly commonplace. So one of our challenges from education and training is how do we prepare uh, the, the current generation as well as future generations for a world where that kind of technology is going to become reality. And in many, in lots of places, that technology is already part of the reality and is being used. So it's how this technology goes to scale. Around half the people in this room that work for the NHS, you'll still be working for the NHS in 20 years' time, which again begins to set some implications about not just what your basic education and training is. I think that's a good thing, uh, those of you that are smiling. Uh, I want you to stay in 20 years' time. Uh, 
not least because some of you might be looking after me when I'm uh, at that age, uh, at the baby boomer, but the serious point is, as we have this conversation about how science and technology is going to change what we do, uh, we don't just have to think about what basic undergraduate and postgraduate uh, training is, but we need to think about what ongoing training is, what is the upskilling that's required for the work that you do. And again, I think that's a core role for HEE and helping us think that through with you who are going to be um, in that position is absolutely key. So I am going to uh, come to the end of this now. I want, uh, though... Uh, just to share with you something that has been part of uh, pretty much a set presentation I've been making as I've gone around making these presentations, uh, just to draw some of these points out. I've been thinking of um, the work um, that we need to do across uh, the health uh, care system in the NHS around education and training. And I'm thinking about the workforce challenge in four groups or uh, buckets, if you'll allow me to refer to you as being in a bucket. Uh, firstly, there's a current workforce, um, and we do need uh, people to stay. We do need more coming in, but actually one of the key challenges is about retention. We're losing too many people, and too many skilled people uh, with too much experience, and, um, which is why uh, one of the key issues on the interim people plan was about making the NHS a better place or the best place for people to work, because that issue about how we retain uh, people becomes absolutely crucial. Critical. I'm not going to go through that, but the importance of engaging and listening to staff about flexibility in the workplace, about the support, the physical, psychological and emotional support to promote people's well-being, all become absolutely cru uh, crucial. Um, and how we um, uh, take the learning from uh, those best-performing organisations about how they listen and act and improve the experience of their staff uh, is really important. But how we create a future, and uh, in HEE we've got 17 digital topple fellows um, that were introduced this year, and I want just to draw attention to one of those. Uh, one of the fellows is Melanie Martin, who's an advanced physio physiotherapy practitioner from Guys and Tommies, who's currently balancing an advanced practitioner role in rheumatology with leading a team designing a user-centred remote monitoring system uh, for long-term uh, long conditions via a two-way uh, SMS messaging services for those uh, in flare. And again, it combines many, many of the things I talked about, about technology changing the care pathways, which will then have implications for the jobs that people do, which then in turn has implications for the education and training that we need to put in place. So a really good example of uh, beginning to pioneer. And I think uh, you as uh, advanced clinical practitioners are leading the way in testing out new ways of working uh, and uh, taking that forward. Uh, a big shout out for me for Rotating Paramedic uh, pilot programme which aims to send the most appropriate healthcare professionals with the appropriate skill set to offer definitive patient care, the right response, first time 999 calls, urgent and emergency uh, calls as well. I was in West Midlands Ambulance Service um, uh, yesterday, yesterday, no, Tuesday, and um, uh, 400 uh, paramedics, 100 graduate paramedics, uh, and 300 going through the apprenticeship route that they're running. Uh, and uh, there would have been a paramedic on every ambulance they dispatched on Tuesday, and they had 400 para uh, ambulances on the road uh, the peak of their service on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, absolutely fascinating and a really good example of what paramedics are contributing to improving patient care. Uh, if I was in an accident in the West Midlands, I have some confidence of the skill level that was going to turn up on that ambulance and um, uh, really uh, showing the way of what is possible. I also just want to make a point, and this came out very powerfully for me in West Midlands, about how we ensure our workforce reflects the communities uh, that they serve. I, I have to say you look a white workforce uh, in this room as I'm stood in front of you and I say this as a white middle-aged uh, now middle-class man um, but looking at you you look very white and I asked the question about how far you represent the population that you serve in your constituencies and um, I think this is something we need to do so we're opening up different routes into the workforce uh, thinking about uh, widening participation 
promoting social mobility and I think some of the apprenticeship programmes in your communities are doing exactly that but it's, uh, there are other routes to do that. I'm also uh, keen to promote um, the millennial voice in this conversation. Um, as a baby boomer I think I've got a set of attitudes and values uh, my children are millennials. I think they care about things as much as I do. I think they work just as hard as I ever did and continue to do. Um, but what I am clear about is the psychological contract with work is a completely different one to mine. And they do demand flexibility, and if they don't get it, they'll go and sell their skills somewhere else, quite frankly, and they're both skillful enough to be able to do that, and that's what we'll do. And unless we waken up to that and begin to create more flexible environments, we're not going to be in the right place to hold on to the skill we need in the future. So the millennial voice is hugely important. I do need to um, look now. I wanted to uh, say a bit more about um, the innovations in education, about where on undergraduate uh, courses some of the stuff around science and technology is beginning to be taught as part of the curriculum. Um, really interesting about those that do and those that don't and how we can create that conversation. Um, but that's the current workforce. I want to say something about the future, uh, um, um, future workforce, about how do we look at that curriculum, how is that curriculum developing, and whether we are uh, providing curriculum which are preparing people for the jobs that they'll be doing when they graduate, not the jobs we think uh, are relevant now and um, uh, some real challenges there. The third bucket I think about are the new roles that we will need. Um, uh, there's a very good debate about uh, certain groups that we will need more of in the future, but I also think we'll need different. I think we'll need more bioinformaticians. I think we'll need more data analysts. Uh, and I think we need to think just as uh, broadly a, a, about that skill that we will require in, in our workforce in the future alongside others. And the, third, uh, the fourth and final group I want to uh, just ask us to reflect on, and I've already made reference to this, is uh, those of us as citizens who are using technology um, to learn about our long-term conditions, our conditions, and very often we'll go and consult with clinicians knowing as much about our long-term condition as some of the clinicians we're seeing, and how do we see that as a good thing to be embraced rather than a threat. Uh, but equally, um, many of us will know people who've got uh, diabetes who are self-managing uh, using monitors. And uh, again, um, what I see happening there is the demand on uh, healthcare services being reduced because of people's ability to self-manage. And most of the people that I know that are self-managing actually know exactly what they need to do if they've got a spike on their graphs in terms of uh, the treatment that they need to take. They now no longer need to consult a clinician about what action to take, they're taking that action themselves. And I think that technology is going to change uh, the way that we uh, engage with it. That's all for me. Uh, uh, thanks very much for listening. I'm really sorry to the timekeeper who's frowning at me now uh, 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 for abusing the time. Um, I hope you've got something from it. I wish you well for the rest of the day and thanks very much.